Welcome to The Faithful Steward. This is a podcast all about sharing biblical wisdom and practical insights in order to help church leaders pursue and teach financial freedom as part of Christian discipleship. We believe this is a spiritual conversation and this is a place where the church needs to lead the way in order to move our communities forward in how we steward God's resources. I'm your host, James Lenhoff, and I am so passionate about this conversation and helping leaders have the confidence to step into it. We believe that if we help people thrive financially and grow spiritually, it changes everything. And I am so excited to join you on this journey. This podcast is brought to you by GoodSense. If you'd like more information about what we're up to, you can go to our website at goodsensemovement.org. All right, let's get started with today's conversation. So last week we talked about sending kids off to college and what all of that entails and how to step into that season, how to prepare for that season. Now we're actually going to talk today about the opposite end of that spectrum when we've actually sent our kids off to college. And yet somehow or another, we end up turning our empty nest into a revolving door where we have these kids, these adult children that are moving back in more and more. This phenomenon is happening where families have these adult children that have come back into the household for lots of different reasons. And a lot of times those families are also dealing with aging parents. And so they're, they're surrounded by dependency. If we had stepped into this season expecting that our kids were going to be fully up and on their own and that we were going to be done supporting them and there would be no more financial obligation for us to care for them, and yet we find ourselves with somebody living in our basement. And we didn't see that coming. We didn't plan for that. We didn't talk about it. And now we're stuck in that situation. How do we deal with these types of circumstances? And how do we help coach people who might be wrestling through this? That's what I want to dive into today. And what we want to start with is just this acknowledgement that we can't make any progress unless we are committed, both sides of this equation committed to open dialogue. Communication is where most of the time this breaks down. There's a lot of uh, resentment, a lot of expectation, a lot of missed opportunities for us to connect on what we're both actually hoping for, but we don't talk about it. And so we end up stuck in these constant uh, push-pull scenarios of frustration and resentment and shame and guilt. Progress doesn't happen accidentally. We do need to be intentional about those conversations. One of the reasons why I think this becomes a problem is because when you when your child wasn't an adult, the expectations may have been more clearly understood, right? You you had really clear you had a curfew, you had, you know, chores, you had these responsibilities and when you were mom and dad and they were a 8-year-old kid, it was just kind of the deal. You were the boss. You decided what needed to happen and you told them and they either fought you on it and complained about it. But at the end of the day, they did it. The idea of having mutually uh, understood expectations when you have an adult living with adults is a very, very different experience. And it's, it's something that a lot of times gets really confused. If when they were a child, uh, they got everything they wanted you know, you, you just kind of bought them all the things it was easy to afford. So you just bought whatever they wanted to be happy. You may set them up with a sense of entitlement. And so now they live in your house because they have this assumption that they're welcome there, that they're entitled to live there, that why wouldn't they be? You've, there's always been this assumption that, I, that they get what they want. Or maybe you have created in your conversation with them as they were growing up that The assumption is that you will be up on your own, that you will be off of our dime, that you are not going to be dependent on us. And if they find themselves in a situation where they are dependent, maybe it's not a fault of their own. Maybe they, you know, had a job loss or an injury or some scenario where they really are not able to be fully up and on their own. 
because the expectation was always there that they would be, they may be wrestling with a deep sense of shame, a sense of uh, failure, this this identity that they are not good enough, they're not living up to your expectations, and that despair can actually spiral them into more and more failure, more and more shame, and it actually can become this kind of self-feeding, vicious cycle. And so a lot of that conversation needs to start with what was the expectation, what was the experience when you were here and you were under my household as a child, and now what is going to be different as an adult? Because if we take the same assumptions, both sides of this equation, if the parents have the same assumption that they had when their kid was a kid, uh, and now that kid is an adult, we're going to butt heads all the time. If the kid has the same assumption that, hey, as a kid, you just paid for all my stuff. Like, I never paid rent. I never paid for food. I never had to do any of that stuff. Why would you expect me to do that now? We're going to butt heads, right? So we need to just start with the recognition that it is different when you have an adult kid than it is when you have a young child that's living under your household. So let's just air all of that, clear all of that out, and then we can start the process of setting expectations for what this experience needs to look like. It's really, really important that we don't apply the expectations that we had when they were 10 to them when they're 28. Those are not going to work. They certainly, by definition, shouldn't work. We should have higher expectations of responsibility when they're 28 than we did when they were 10. And they should have higher expectations of autonomy and being able to make their own decisions when they're 28 than they did when they were 10, right? It's reasonable for us to approach this differently, and we need to. If we have agreed to allow this adult child to move back into our house, we want to actually start with where are we? What are we feeling? You know, give your child a chance to to air some of the emotion that they might be wrestling with, where they're saying things like, I feel like a failure. I feel a tremendous amount of shame that I'm moving back in with you. I don't want to be here. Or maybe your kid is like, this is great. I mean, I'm going to live on mom and dad's dime as long as I can because it's way, way cheaper. We need to make sure we know where they're coming from. At the same time, the parents need to do the same. Right? What are your feelings? Are you feeling like you're a failure? That somehow you let them down because your whole job was to get them to be self sufficient, and now here they are still dependent. Are you carrying some shame and some sense of guilt? Or are you just frustrated because you look back and you say, I did everything for you. I made all of this happen for you, and this is how you repay me that you stay dependent instead of going and being responsible for yourself. Whether it's self-loathing or shame, or it is frustration or a sense of hopelessness. Those are all things we need to get out on the table because we can make assumptions. We could, for example, make the assumption that our kid is entitled and is rooted in this sense of kind of a, being a freeloader. All the while, they feel a deep sense of shame and, and, and have identified themselves as a failure and they're hopeless. And if we are approaching them with a tone that is punishing them for being a freeloader, we're only pouring salt in that wound. We're only making their shame worse. And so we need to start with that clear understanding of what we're actually feeling so that we can really acknowledge those things and then approach the next part of the conversation with that awareness. Because this, the next step in the conversation is understanding how we got here. So, you are coming into our home and you're feeling a deep sense of shame and a sense of failure. What has happened? What of those things are under your control? So if they're feeling shame, but they're moving back in because they got a divorce or they're moving back in because uh, they lost their job or they had a situation that was so far beyond and so much more complicated than just, I made a bad decision, then we need to help them understand hey, this is not on you. We can actually come against those thoughts that are leading to shame. If they're coming in and the reason 
that they're here is because of some bad decisions, but they're not feeling any shame. They're not feeling any guilt. They're kind of like, yeah, whatever, you know, hey, it's life. We do need to actually hold them to account. We need to challenge them on some of these things. Hey, you're not making responsible uh, decisions from a place of faithful stewardship. You're being reckless. Your your decision making is harming you. Call them to account on that. Wake them up a little bit, right? That next conversation is how did we get here? What responsibility do we need to take? And what responsibility are we taking that we shouldn't be? Let's digest that together because it's really helpful for the parents to recognize, hey, this isn't his fault. This isn't her fault. This isn't what she would choose. Or it's really healthy for the kid to recognize, hey, this is on you, man. Like you did this. You brought a lot of this on yourself. These decisions that you made were harmful and you need to own that. You need to recognize that. We don't want to spiral them in shame, but we do want them to actually be aware that they need to make smarter, wiser decisions. And then we can help them with that. Not from a place of judgment and punishment, but just calling them to more awareness in how they're making those decisions, helping them think through things with a little bit different lens. This is a time for understanding, not lecturing. This is a time for you to engage in really helpful, honest, authentic conversation without being the overbearing mom and dad that's crushing and, and putting these, these heavy lectures on your kid. What we want to start to map out together is a temporary solution that bridges the gap, that gets them back to being self-sufficient. And we are going to do a lot of damage if we're coming in hot, if we're bringing a lot of judgment and I'm disappointed in you kind of tones, uh, we're going to shut them down and we're actually going to make some of those temporary solutions become more permanent if we're not careful. We need to start that work to establish really clear boundaries. We need to treat our adult children like adults. They have a autonomy over their lives. They get to make their own decisions. They get to do what they choose to do. That is true. We, we are not in the same space of parent like we were when they were 10. However, they are an adult guest in our household. And so it is reasonable for us to have boundaries, to have expectations like we would with anyone who was coming to stay with us in our household. It is not unreasonable for us to have expectations but those need to be communicated clearly, not with any kind of vitriol or venom, but just this really clear, level-headed understanding of, hey, as an adult that is staying in our household, these are the things we would expect from anyone, not just you as our kid. Literally, if any adult came and said, I'm going to stay in your house for a month, these are the things we would ask them to do. Set those boundaries right out of the gate, because if we don't communicate them day one, by day 30 or 40 or 180, those boundaries aren't communicated clearly. They're communicated as punishments, as rage, as anger, as, as you know, shame and guilt. We communicate them with so much more emotion the longer we wait to communicate them. So right out of the gate, we need to set those clear, established boundaries. Some of those boundaries involve the financial limitations. What are the levels of support that you're willing to offer as mom and dad? what makes sense, what is sustainable, what is affordable, and how long is that going to last? Decide day one how that's going to look. We don't want to leave those things unsaid because if the child has the assumption that I'm never paying for food, I'm never paying for rent, I'm not covering any costs, I'm not actually going to need to foot any of these bills that I'm creating, that assumption will carry forward and will grow. Those kinds of things become contagious in that they start to treat this place as if it's theirs. They start to use it in ways that you would never expect an adult guest in your home to use your home. So what are those financial obligations? What are the expectations that you have? This is going to be more of a roommate situation than a mom, dad, child situation. We need to elevate it 
to more of a shared responsibility type of experience if we're going to let them back in as adults. There may be some staging of some of these boundaries. You may say, hey, I recognize you're in a really bad way. We will cover the first month worth of your expenses here. But that is not going to be the assumption. We are going to start weaning that away. We're going to start taking away some of those supports. We don't want to because we're angry and we didn't communicate it very clearly on the front end, we don't want six months from now to all of a sudden come along and knock all the support out from under the kid because that just sets them up for more failure. But if we start with a lot of support, we need to be starting down a path where that support is being withdrawn and they start to stand on their own power. It's really, really important that that doesn't happen overnight, and that it's not communicated. Those are two really big mistakes that I see all the time, where somebody just finally gets fed up, a kid you know, makes a mistake, uses the house in a way they didn't want them to, uh, they just come home and they're playing video games for the hundredth time, and they're just like, that's it, you're out, you're done, the support is gone. Those kinds of kind of tearing away the support that... The kid has come to count on because there was no communication that it would ever go away. That is the kind of terror that can destroy the relationship and really create a lot of damage. And so we want to be very clear on the front end. The plan as it stands today is we're going to support you in this way for this long. Those things are subject to change, but we will be communicating all along. And we're starting from day one saying this is our base case. So that everyone's clear, we know where this thing ends and at what point you are expected to be able to take care of yourself. If we start down that path together and somewhere along the way decide, for whatever reason, that we are going to change that boundary, we are allowed to do that as mom and dad. But unless we choose to change that boundary, that boundary stays in place, that end goal, those those points at which we're withdrawing support in order to prepare them, those all need to continue as planned. Otherwise, if we just kind of keep things the way they are and we never actually withdraw, we're setting ourselves up for that rip scenario where all of a sudden we get fed up and we pull it all away at the same time, or because financially we can't afford it, we're forced to pull it all away at the same time. And both of those are damaging. So we want to make sure we're walking down that road together according to the plan we set out. One of the last pieces that we want to make sure we're talking about from the beginning is what needs to be true in order for you to launch confidently. We want to begin the conversation with the end in mind. The end is you are on your own, you're self-sufficient, you're living an adult life, and you're doing the things that lead to thriving. That may not be true today. But our goal together is that it is true by a certain point in time. What would need to happen? Let's let's hash through all that at the beginning. Because we don't want to be nebulous about this. We don't want to be just kind of hoping for something to work out. We do want to have a clear vision of what needs to change. So it may be, for example, in order for you to be thriving... You need to be in a place where you have been sober for three months. Maybe that's a target that we aim at. Or if in order for you to be thriving, you need to be in a, in a career path. You need to be back up on your feet, working in a job, making at least you know, $36,000 a year, let's say. right? What are those hard and fast kind of structural targets that we can aim at? Because now we know what we're trying to make progress towards. There is a specific thing that we're trying to achieve rather than we just want you out of our house. That doesn't feel good. That doesn't feel like something to aim at. But if we've decided ahead of time, this is, these are the things that we need to accomplish. We want this to be true by this time frame, right? We, we want you to be in a career where you are confident you have the ability to make enough to cover your bills by the end of 90 days, let's say, right? Now the conversation is not, when are you going to get out of here? When are you going to leave? When are you going to get on your feet? The conversation is, what have you been doing to make progress towards the goal that we said we're aiming at? 
you know, how many job interviews have you uh, had? How many applications have you submitted? What uh, networking can we help you do? How do we continue to move towards this target? There's, there's a sense of teaming up. We don't want to be against our kid. We don't want to be saying, get out of here. Why are you still here? What are you doing with your life? That is only adding shame and pouring gasoline on the fire. But if we say, hey, this is where we're trying to get to together. What have you done? What can I do to help you? These are the things we need to accomplish. And this is the time frame we set out for it. Super, super helpful to get that established early because at the beginning of this, there tends to be less hope, more despair, more shame and self-loathing. And one of the ways we can come against that is to actually give a target that's hopeful. Hey, we can do this. This is actually very attainable for you. You're talented. You're, built, you're, you're capable. This is going to be okay. But these are the things we need to do. And so it actually can combat some of that hopelessness they're walking in with. And we do want to ensure that our child is taking responsibility for moving that ball forward because the timeline is still the timeline. And there may be a point where, unfortunately, if they have not taken it seriously, if they have not made steps to move things forward, we still hold them to that timeline and they suffer some consequences that are painful. And I know that's hard to watch. I know that's hard to accept as parents. But sometimes that is the only way that our kids can actually get to a place of thriving is if they go through some suffering. And so we want to continue to encourage them to take the steps, to own the process, to move forward and make some of that progress. But at the same time, even if they're not, we are holding to the timeline that we committed to. We're holding to withdrawing those supports on the timeline we said we would. We get to continue to walk the path we committed to. And the consequences as adults are theirs to bear. I know this process is really hard. I also know it is happening way more often. The financial situation of kids is very different. They're facing really high housing costs. They're facing really high inflation. They're experiencing a lot of career transition and turnover on a regular basis. It is messy. I think it is messier now than it was 15, 20, 25 years ago. And we just need to acknowledge that. And yet, it is still doable. And so when we call our kids to faithful stewardship, to be intentional with how they're managing God's resources, that is ultimately what sets them up to launch and gets us to a place where we can continue to have thriving relationships with them that aren't challenged by this dependency that we can unintentionally perpetuate. We are able to empower our kids to step into adulthood with more confidence, more clarity, and a higher calling to honor God with their lives. Well, thank you so much for listening to the Faithful Steward podcast. Be sure to check out the show notes for links and other information that we mentioned in today's episode. Also, be sure to check out our website at goodsensemovement.org to get all the resources we offer churches to help equip them in teaching financial stewardship to their community. If you have any questions or any topics you want to make sure we cover on our show, you can email me at jameslenhoff at goodsensemovement.org. I'd love to hear from you. I hope you all have a great week. We'll talk to you next week. Thank you.